Hello and welcome to the Incinerator Art Award 2020 Symposium. My name is Jake Tracy, curator at Incinerator Gallery, and I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from where I broadcast today, the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respect to their spirits, ancestors, elders and community members, past and present, and recognize that sovereignty was never ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Furthermore, I pay my respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be tuning in to today's conversation. As part of the Incinerator Art Award 2020, we'll be exploring four key themes of social justice across four video conversations, underscoring how art may bring about social change. In this talk, I am joined by artists Carly Fisher, Carla Pringle, Nicholas Burridge, and Nina Sonadze as we explore the theme, environment. I've asked the artist three provocations. What is your relationship to or within an environment? How do we care or foster environment? And what may we learn from environment? Carly, perhaps I can uh, start the conversation with yourself. Could you tell us a little bit more about your work in the Incinerator Art Awards and the engagement your practice has with natural and urban environments? Yeah, so um, my work, which is a sculptural and audio installation um, called It's Easy to Forget How Old This Place Is, um, actually began um, just pre-COVID times or pre kind of it, it being mainly known about in Australia, I guess. Um, and it started through a similar process to, to that, which I, I usually kind of start work, which is in response to an environment. Um, and that environment being a general environment. So like not seeing there being a kind of a, um, a distinction between a natural environment and an urban environment or, um, you know, local or kind of general and those kind of things. But, but environments that, that I, I, I respond to um, basically through, um, they come about through different reasons, I guess. Um, sometimes they're in response to uh, local environments that are in my immediate surroundings. Sometimes it's through a residency. Um, sometimes it's through travel. But usually the, the work starts through um, looking and listening and through walking often, um, which is just like navigating, I guess, um, the immediate area around um, which I've, I've chosen to respond to. Um, or sometimes where I come across, you know, it's not necessarily always intentional um, or, dire or directed. Um, this work started in response to um, my immediate local environment of Coburg and Brunswick in Melbourne. Um, and it started just through the fact that I'm always wander wandering around those areas anyway. Um, and then it was compounded by the fact that there was lockdown. So the lockdown period meant that I couldn't really travel outside of those areas um, or limited access to at the start, I guess, during March. And then, you know, more and more it's, it's exacerbated into only immediate um, environments, I guess. So I guess like in answer to your questions, Jake, in terms of the three questions, I kind of see them interrelating. So rather than them being like distinct ideas of like, how do I respond or how do I see environment? Um, how can I, what was the other one? I can't remember, but, um, but yeah, how, how do I um, learn from environment? For example, it's all interrelated. So the way that um, this works come about in a similar way to a lot of works that I make um, is through um, responding to the environment by um, learning through listening and looking. So just small details are really important to the kind of work that I do. So just like wandering and, um, and listening to the different kind of sounds that surround me, the different fragments that are interrelating all the time. So those ideas of environment being as an intersection between different kind of fragments that happen, um, whether they're kind of overheard stories, um, there may be a little bit of research I might do on the internet or wherever, as well as those kind of immediate fragments, like the immediate objects or, um, 
or factors in the environment or things that I overhear. Um, what I'm interested in terms of that is um, quieter kind of narratives. So I'm interested in the idea of like place as a kind of a quite a broad and nondescript kind of term, but then kind of zooming in on different details of that in terms of looking at the sometimes overlooked details within places, the, the quieter histories um, or hidden histories sometimes, the different kind of intersecting or interrelated layers of time and place. Um, and thinking about place as kind of like this constant negotiation that's constantly shifting between different perspectives and different happenings and in different interactions kind of meandering, you know, and kind of like weaving together, I guess. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, that's very much how I work and that's how this work um, came about. This, the, I mean, the, the distinction with this work is that it's specifically about my local area. Um, which I haven't responded to as specifically before, like just, you know, Coburg, Brunswick kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I think what's interesting is that it was kind of preemptive in a way because I started it before the COVID time and then it was kind of illuminated more through that period. And I started, uh, well, I started the, the actual physical work before, but I was kind of continuing making it through throughout this time. And so things shifted, um, but it was also the same in a way. So it's kind of interesting because that's the way I work naturally. I was allowed that time and also, um, I guess, um, you know, restricted in terms of the zone that I could work with, um, the material access, all that kind of thing. But um, yeah, so that was quite interesting, like thinking about my process and reflecting on it more through this period. Um, yeah, my process is usually, as with this work, I guess, um, you know, collecting fragments, some of them be like objects that I find in the area or field recordings in terms of sounds and that kind of thing. And some of it's um, reflective on the memory of that place in terms of thinking about um, what I've experienced or the interactions. Um, it's often kind of peripheral kind of stuff that I include in my finished works that become kind of like assemblages, whether assemblage in terms of like a sculptural installation across space or in within one object. This one's kind of a little bit of a combination of two. Um, you know, so there's fragments of, um, you know, old industrial areas in Coburg, like the old magic sign, which is like the old magic kitchens, which is one of my favorite signs around Coburg, all rusted up and that kind of thing. And then there's the Mary Creek, um, which is obviously an ancient, place um, that's been here way, way, way longer than any of these other fragments that I've included. So um, I've included um, sound recordings from the Mary Creek um, and mixing those with like some of the construction noises that are happening around um, the area as it's becoming more and more kind of gentrified. Um, and yeah, and then there's fragments from the creek like the, um, the basalt rocks that a part of um, Mary Creek was a lava flow, an uh, ancient lava flow. So there's remnants of that all along, um, all throughout Melbourne really, but that along its kind of tributaries, there's um, a lot of evidence of that as well. Um, whether they be kind of like the scoria, that's like all the, you know, the holes, um, the rocks with all the holes in them, or, um, you know, bigger lumps of basalt, really heavy lumps of basalt. So I've gathered fragments of that and that's become part of the installation some other fragments of the installation are fabricated. Mm -hmm. um, everything's kind of given a similar treatment in terms of it becomes this kind of neutral surface um, in terms of it being like kind of painterly, I guess. Um, and some of the reasons for that is to kind of include different elements of time, but also collapse them into the same kind of plane. And also the idea of reconstructing or um, altering things in some way as the act of noticing, re-noticing some of these objects um, and the act of making as well, rather than just collecting and including, you know, found objects as the work. Um, the act of making for me is, is about my relationship with the objects as well. It's really important. They're very durational relationships because they take a lot of time and labour. So I'm kind of 
um, thinking about like, you know, the material in terms of how do I make something look like cardboard? How do I make something look like it's a rock or more rock-like than a rock? You know, this kind of thing. Um, so it's about my relationship of learning about the place through the materials, through the fragments, through reconstructing, through creating alternate dialogues through these fragments. So little snippets of um, tags that I've come across that for me are very kind of apt commentary on the situation, like some of the tags that I noticed in the start of lockdown, like shake world, that kind of thing, you know, which I was just like, yeah, <laughs> that says a lot mm -hmm. about this period kind of thing. And combining okay. those elements with like, you know, um, lichen and basalt and then like, you know, an Uber Eats bag and all these kind of fragments from different times um, and places to some extent, but they've all kind of accumulated here. Um, so thinking about how those layers interact, I guess, because rather than thinking about dualities and how can we learn in terms of categories of natural or kind of, um, you know, fabricated or industrial or all these different kind of categories, how these things intersect in more of a kind of entangled relationship and how they can evolve, how they can have a negotiation, even things like the Merry Creek and the construction, you know, mm. how they can kind of have a dialogue with each other that's kind of ebbing and flowing to a certain degree rather than there being some kind of a takeover or some kind of a, um, yeah, a binary in a way. I suppose Sorry, I've, I've rambled on. No, the rambling no, is part of my no, process. Absolutely. No, but that's, that's it. You know, the rambling yeah. is the trajectory of thoughts. It's a trajectory that's of words. That's the way like I, you, my you take us on that journey to a place. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And, and that, fine. you know, Mary Creek has, has historically always been a meeting place. And it yeah. continues to be a meeting place through yeah. that natural and urban environments as well. I really liked the idea of the collapsing of time and the historic lava flow that had informed the particular um, uh, Victorian landscape, which I think flows on quite nicely as well to maybe move on to um, Nicholas Burridge to talk a little bit about your work because your work, your work included into the award um, is sort of excavated from longstanding research that you've done into uh, the tectonic nature and the environmental histories of of Victoria. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that work and, and, and your practice at large. Yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, it, it stemmed from, well, it stemmed from growing up in the Macedon Ranges and growing up near a lot of volcanoes. Um, and then later getting involved with the Living Museum and the research they'd done into the ecology and geology of of the of Western Victoria, which um, for those of you who don't know, um, is the third largest volcanic plain in the world. There's over over 400 eruption sites across the plain, and it's been going on for millions of years. The most recent eruption was about 4,000 years ago, but I think. Like a lot of ecology, it's, it's quite subtle in the way that it's expressed in the landscape and it's easily overlooked or forgotten, um, but it defines our lives and has defined this landscape and the people that have lived here and the animals that have lived here and the plants that have grown here uh, so dramatically. Now, whether that's the fertile soils of the plains or the rock that's produced from the lava flows um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite powerful, but it's at the moment dormant. Um, so I guess for me, my, my scale of time is kind of human time and it's hard to see kind of so far back in history and kind of see these geological processes and understand them in, in a way that's not completely abstracted and, so my process has been trying to, I guess, uh, talk to rocks for a lack of a better phrase, um, by uh, engaging with them. So part of that, uh, like the work for incinerator has been through melting them, turning them back into lava and then sculpting uh, with that material. But there's been other kind of discoveries I've had while working with the material. Um, 
and each discovery kind of leads to a new question. So recently I found that if you hold the blue, typically blue basalt at a really high temperature uh, for a long time, it turns red and it's all of the iron that's going to the surface of the rock. And I found that really interesting because the iron is the thing that makes our plains, the volcanic plains so fertile. And it's the reason that they were so abundant pre-colonial history. And it's the reason that they're so degraded post because they were such good places to run cattle and do all the agricultural things that we've done across these areas. Um, yeah. So it's a yeah, there's a lot of memory point. that's there's a lot of memory that's um, contained in the materiality of um, uh, your practice, and you really demonstrate the uh, that transformative nature of the basalt um, and that memory that it holds, and in particular your works um, concerned with the Anthropocene history, um, the human impact that um, can be made um, uh, and sometimes irrevocably onto mm. a, a natural environment or into an environment. Was there anything that you had sort of found upon your research, um, uh, um, uh, maybe your recent residencies that have informed some of that information? Yeah, I think, um, I think the Anthropocene, although it's a bit of a buzzword at the moment, is a really interesting thing to think about. And I mean, my art practice is a part of that as much as, or more than most things in the sense that I create geological anomalies, um, things that are natural in a sense, but they, but they, but they wouldn't occur in a, in a normal geological environment, uh, which, is, which is kind of the age of the Anthropocene, this, this geology that is less, or geological epoch that is less driven by planetary systems and, and more driven by systems that humans have created. Um, so it's something, a question I kind of struggle with is, is do you, am I playing into that or am I, I mean, it's it kind of like Carly was talking about, it's, it's a reality nonetheless, these worlds overlap. Mm, yeah, and there's a, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to be informed as well um, between that environment and how it evolves and changes and therefore informs us and maybe we can use that as a little segue as well into Carla's practice um uh, Carla Pringle you know like your your work um uh, your practice at large but also your work for the incinerator art awards documents that complex relationship and history with environment which at times is very personal for you as well and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your work and, and the environments explored in your practice, how they inform the personhood. Yeah, I, so I, the Anthropocene, I'll just start with that. Because it's, it, it, even though it talks about our power to kill, it doesn't talk about our power to cure. Mm -hmm. And people have lived within this environment for a really long time. We have the oldest culture in the world in Australia. And they lived with this in a symbiotic, you know, um, reverence with an intricately woven connection with, with the land. I think a lot of that comes from disembodiment, comes from leaving our bodies out of the equation of the world, when we talk about the Anthropocene, it's like we're doing something to something as opposed to being a part of what we are, you know, we're actually the thing, we're doing the thing to, you know, we're not separate from any of that. Um, I had a situation where my body stopped working and it was, I had to learn how to walk again and I had to learn how to trust the ground would hold me. It was from um, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And I moved home in the midst of this healing. Well, it's been 10 years, it took me 10, um, in my 10th year of it or 11th year of it. And I had to learn to trust the ground where I grew up to walk on and to feel part of it. 
And I, ha I have a complex history here. I mean, I had an abusive childhood, but also I come from a colonial family who were abusing everyone else as well. So there's this real like, can I be here? Can this land, can this land forgive me? Can I forgive me? Can I, who, how does my body, how does my body work in this place? You know, I lived in Melbourne for 20 years to avoid coming back, really. Um, I, I love, I spent a lot of time on the Mary Creek while I was down there. Cause, and, but, um, yeah, so I think separating our bodies from the environments, separating, one of the things I had to learn was because I was triggered easily by everything, by sight, smell, sensory information. I had to realize that there's so much information our bodies are comprehending all the time. Our brains just sort of shortcut a lot of it and go with what matches. So we'll just um, use hacks, I guess, to get through reality um, rather than actually seeing things as they are. And stories, stories are really important. If we tell stories like the Anthropocene, those stories become real in a way, you know? Um, and I think what we really need to be talking about is um, Glenn Albrecht, he's a environmental philosopher and he talks about things like the symbiocene, which is about us being with the environment, reconnecting with the environment, realizing our relationship with the environment. And that can be really complex. It can be really challenging because some of us have really hard relationships and all, we all probably do. You know, it's hard being a human being on this earth, the way we've created our culture. And so I think we can't separate culture or humanity from the environment at all. We can't separate any of it. Like it's all all rubbish or it's all tangled it's all tangled mm -hmm. and it's sort of about us being able to sit with all of that and go okay I'm here now and really feel what it feels to be human and to stop disconnecting our bodies from things that are too hard and it's pretty that's pretty hard because we live in a world that's full of trauma and we're constantly bombarded with trauma images and trauma messages but I find that when I, in the, when if you go to the, land gets traumatized too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not separate and so traumatized people traumatize land. Mm. And mm. so I think it's our responsibility to look at our culture and our, in ourselves so that we can live in coexistence with the planet a lot better than what we are, you know. It's really well said, Carla. I completely agree with you. And I think there's many artists in this particular year's award that agree as well. I mean, we look at Sally Foster's um, Burnt Koala sculpture that's participating in this award as well. And those dioramifications of when we place ourselves above or separate, as you were saying before, uh, having that disembodiment from from the landscape or a natural environment, instead of being able to have that relationship or relationality with the natural space and ourselves, because we are essentially all a part of it. And that's what creates an ecology. Um, I also really like that idea that environment can also carry trauma with it as well. And maybe I can use that um, as a link as well into Nina Sanadze's work. And this work in particular, um, at Nina in, in, in the Incinerator Art Award for this year, you've asked viewers to really examine our fragility, but also our personal agency and responsibility to environment. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about this work in the award, um, and then also like broader the political awareness that underpins your practice. Oh, thank you, Jake. Uh, yes, my, my end goal, uh, in this, my contribution, I think, to environment in this work is looking through political uh, scene and the change that we can do, uh, create through affecting the um, the way we change, uh, the way we vote. And um, it really started, the film is actually made in uh, in the area, in the forest around Brusen, 
uh, and uh, straight after the New Year fire, so I went there to film it, which kind of, it's the land of uh, Gunai, Gunai land, and um, just coming from St Kilda where I live, <laughs> from an urban area and kind of not really belonging in that place felt sort of quite wrong uh, in one way. On the other hand, I felt uh, that um, I had to tell the story the way I saw it. And my story in this, uh, in this world begins far, far away from, from a place where I come from, which is Georgia and Soviet Union. So sort of quite unrelated history, you would think. Yet, um, um, how it started is that uh, through experience of my parents who actually never had a, a, a vote kind of uh, growing up mm -hmm. in Soviet Union, they couldn't vote. Uh, and if they did, they, there was only one party they could go and vote for. Uh, in 2019 federal elections uh, going, um, uh, I was quite struck uh, by and upset by the outcomes and um, thinking how, you know, here we are um, in, in this time of sort of environmental crisis and yet people are more concerned with uh, sort of more personal uh, interests. And it's really hard to separate this, uh, I guess. Uh, yet uh, uh, when the fires came and I started working with the sort of idea of voting booths as a sculptural form uh, not having an idea what I could do with that. And uh, when the fires uh, started, uh, it was so shocking. It, it really, I, I still was working with this body of work. I, I really, kind of, these two images came together and I understood how, you know, the connection that, uh, and the agency we do have uh, to affect change uh, through, um, you know, personal single vote and so the, and my idea for this work was to create this emotional image um, rather than kind of thinking about what we can do more create one strong image that uh, could stick in your mind next time you know you're voting and kind of remember about the environment and connect the two things mm -hmm. maybe sort of uh, and and have that emotion in, in the image uh, so I, I, I did uh, venture to Brucen Forest, and uh, it was quite an experience taking a road trip through 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 the burnt out place, um, and uh, uh, sort of placing the 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 recycled the voting booths, a repurposed voting booths in there, and then the stark stark kind of contrast, black and white. Uh, uh, little did I know that uh, sort of that's that's the image I had in mind, and then when I came home, I realized that you know, they, I could then turn them into a forest themselves. And when I started rubbing charcoal on this sort of cardboard, some mysteriously, the, 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 the cardboard uh, produced this uh, texture of the bark and of the tree themselves. And so it was sort of really um, uh, scary almost. Uh, so I started to turn these bulls into trees back into trees and they turned in and they became these ghostly sort of shapes also broken and towering they're about three four meters tall and so um, then I came up with the work where it's sort of both the the, the boost in the forest uh, and you know it sort of all spontaneously came to be because uh, the boost I was trying to photograph them in the forest but there's so much wind because there's nothing to stop the wind in this empty forest, there's no birds, there's no sounds, it's absolutely dead and just the wind going through. Uh, and they just kept falling. So I just realized they were just like these bodies falling in the forest. And, um, and they're also kind of signifying people, the, the person standing there. Um, so that's how the work came about. Um, and I, I think this is uh, my response as a city dweller and my responsibility. Uh, to what happens in the country and in the environment from which I'm quite removed on a daily basis, actually. But um, I do sort of, um, I wanted to create this connection, the emotional connection and the visual mm. connection to remember. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a really striking work, Nina. And um, uh, you know, I think whilst this year's award because of COVID-19 has meant that our environments have also shifted in how we present and encounter artwork that 
all four of your works are highly evocative and really demonstrate the um, inextricable relationships that we do have with um, a, a multitude of environments. So maybe I wanted to open up therefore, like between uh, the four of you, if there are any questions or comments or some other words that you wanted to have in terms of our discussion around environment. I did have a question to Carly. Uh, to Carly, uh, at the beginning, I was uh, admiring her work, and, and uh, I, I wanted to know how, whether it was an installation or a video. You know how uh, the push and pull between, you know, what's happening as a video presentation, mm. or, or is it, uh, or encountering the work as an installation, and that kind of um, edit edit uh, sensation of the sound. Or yeah, how did you kind of decide between the installation, the sound? If if we were to encounter your work in in a real gallery, would that be installation with the sound coming through? And I just was yeah, it, it was really diff it was really difficult um, because like with a lot of installations of mine, like they're kind of um, they're quite spatial. So um, especially when there's sound included as well, the sound's usually not just, you know, coming from one kind of source, like one speaker or something, it's usually embedded in the work, um, you know, with multiple speakers in the work and you kind of move around the sculptural installation and kind of the idea is to be drawn closer by the detail in the sculptural work through remaking and the kind of the labour of reconstruction and the small details. Um, and be drawn in through the sound, like the, the, the details of the sound and where it's placed within the sculpture. So you move around and kind of investigate things. So to then have that as, a, as an online presentation is quite difficult. Um, and it doesn't translate completely, it never can. But the idea of the video was because I just didn't think that much would come across with the photos, like a, a couple of photos of the work kind of standing back. Firstly, you can't see that it's reconstructed, that the details of things, it just looks like, you know, it's found objects, which is fine. But a lot of the, the kind of the work is about the curiosity of noticing. So people kind of noticing at some point that, oh, it's, you know, it opens up this portal of like, you know, what things are made of, materiality of things and that kind of thing. And the same with the sound, it's really meant to be about that investigation. So yeah, um, my partner helped me to um, document the work through video. Um, so I was lucky to have that because um, I, I certainly can't do it myself. <laughs> but um, yeah, so she was basically like um, videoing um, very detailed shots throughout, like panning throughout um, as a viewer might walk around the installation and start investigating like the surface of, of objects or the paint the, and all that kind of thing. So that's why um, we made the video um, so that online people could get a sense of the work. And the soundscape is the soundscape that would be used in the installation, but um, you would hear it a bit differently. Um, so it, I made these ceramic pipe forms that are part of the installation that there are speakers inside the pipes. And so the sound of the water and the sound of the construction site noises and all the, the other um, sounds in the soundscape are coming through these pipes. So the sound is quite ambient and resonant and you walk around and you, you have glimpses, um, you have fragments of the sound, I guess, um, and it's in the sculpture. So it's quite different. Yeah, so it's a little bit hard to kind of present that aspect as well. But yeah, that was kind of um, an attempt at trying to create it as an online kind of viewing. Yeah. Fantastic. It's, uh, the third work has been made there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I think, I think um, it's, it's difficult. For a lot of um, work that is more video based, it can translate. Um, some photography can translate, I think, but there's a lot of work that's more sculptural or, um, you know, even painting really, um, that can't translate to an online platform very well. Like, I mean, we'd have no choice in this period, I know, but, um, you know, because I was thinking of, of um, Nicholas's um, rock as well. Like, I mean, they're beautiful photos of the work, but you can't sense that presence unless you're walking around the object, this kind of thing. 
um, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's a difficult one. Because my next question is, it looks like uh, it's dripping with the oil or the metal or whatever, the liquid. Uh, what is it, Nicholas? Can you tell us more about um, it? It is just the basalt. So I've taken a blowtorch and melted the stone and it's dripped from the bottom of the stone. But when it cools in the ambient temperature or when it cools relatively quickly it turns into volcanic glass or obsidian so those drips um, are glass or volcanic glass instead of the stone um, which is kind of one of the things that really fascinates me like jake mentioned before is this transformative aspect i think we perceive stone as something that is um, almost not subject to time and subject to change, but when you expand those time scales to be millions of years, suddenly you have stone as liquid, stone as solid, and then stone as dust. And then it becomes something completely different. Mm. Um, and so these like kind of cyclic aspects, being able to see them in real time is, is quite, um, or inspiring and I think that's kind of something we need a little bit these days not seeing as environment as resource but as something to behold mm. and also as history like history past present and future you know this this idea because um, I did a residency at Living Museum as well and looked at the volcanic plains and that was the first time I knew that it was the third largest basalt plain on earth. And I was angry. I was just so angry that I didn't know that before. The type of history that we learn, you know, as predominantly, or predominantly the, the white history that we learn of Australia, um, you know, we, we just don't learn elements of the environment. You know, our local areas, like the, the different creeks that have made this area what they are, how those creeks were formed through volcanic lava flows. The fact that 350 kilometres of the coastline and 100 kilometres inland is volcanic plains. Like, it's just incredible, you know, and it, the way that things open up when you discover these things that are really so evident, but also hidden at the same time. Um, that yeah, it's encoded in a lot of story, traditional story. You know, it's all there. Yeah, totally. I mean, I knew that there was. The, don't think that. Yeah, the, the volcano. Like there were there were volcanoes here, and the lava flows to some extent, but the extent of it, and how important and how like huge it is, like is just um, is quite incredible. Yeah. So those kind of conversations about. Um, opening up those kind of histories is, is very important to thinking environmentally, you know, and Living Museum is really great for that as well. Like the, the smaller, quieter histories, like the narratives that aren't, you know, the big museum stories, they're kind of like local people, people's stories, their migrant histories, their indigenous stories of the area. Like it's, yeah, it's just, those kind of places are really important and those kind of investigations and threads and stories are really important. Yeah. Mm. Incredible work, Nicholas. I'm just um, traveling in my mind with what you've done, you know, and something like stone that we overlook and then turning it into this original wall and then liquid is the, not something we think about. <clears throat> Think about stone or vessel, right? It's so strong. Um, it just questions everything um, and makes you think about where things come from, from, from how they originate. You know, it's kind of turning everything upside down and just, um, yeah, questioning the very beginnings of where we came from and just really mysterious times. And yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a beautiful example of um, the flux and the flow and the fluidity that resides within everything. Um, and I think maybe with our conversation ending on such an important point to recognize um, the ongoing 
living nature and histories of our environment. So I might conclude a bit of our conversation from there just for this particular talk. Um, thank you all four of you so, so much. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure to be working with you on the Incinerator Art Award. And I wanna thank each of you for joining us today and allowing us the opportunity to dive a little bit deeper into your artistic practices. Um, I, I thank you for your time and I thank you for your excellent conversation surrounding environment. Um, and on that note as well, I would really like to encourage our viewers to visit the Incinerator Art Award website to learn more about this year's award and the artists involved. Uh, the exhibition will be running until the 1st of November and you can visit uh, incineratorgallery.com.au to learn more. And I would encourage you to please stay tuned for the next video coming up in today's symposium. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.